The Grand Teton National Park area has been rich in sustenance for all time. My ancestors, the Shoshone people, inhabited the Grand Teton area. They followed the migration trails of the deer and the elk, the pronghorn, as their sustenance, as their bounty, as their life-giving food. It has been a practice of our people to study our brothers. We watched them closely. We followed them from place to place and we learned from them. There's so many things that we can learn from those animals. Even today, they can teach us. We need to listen to what our animals tell us. Grand Teton is renowned for the world-class scenery here, but it's also home to some of the most spectacular terrestrial migrations that we still have here in North America. And in particular, the mule deer migrations are some of the most incredible migrations to the very far reaches of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. I'm Sarah Dewey, I'm a wildlife biologist at Grand Teton National Park. In 2013, Grand Teton National Park biologists began tracking mule deer with GPS collars to study the migration. We collared 120 mule deer over a number of years. And what we discovered was an incredible diversity of migration routes. Those routes radiate out in multiple directions to the far corners of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. These migrations, these animals traverse uh, the rugged mountains and they go hundreds of miles to get to their winter ranges. While the park may seem pretty big, the migrations are much bigger than the park. The park is too small to meet the year-round needs of the migratory species. And if you study these migration routes, they go beyond any borders. They cross highways, they cross really high mountain passes, and other hazards like fences are things that they have to also navigate. The ancient migration trails led to our hunting trails, and now they're super highways that we travel today. We have our boundaries as citizens of this great land. Our brothers, the animals, they don't know these boundaries. All they know is their life ways. They know that if they can get from place to place and follow these migration routes, they will continue to live. Grand Teton National Park is a very inhospitable place in the winter. We receive significant snowfall throughout most of the park during the winter months. What that means, because mule deer have a relatively slender body type, they just are not capable of surviving our harsh winter conditions in this landscape. 
Only the hardiest animals stay. Take for instance the bison. They have a big woolly coat and they have strong head, neck muscles so that they can move a lot of snow to find forage beneath the snow. Of animals like moose, they have long legs so they can navigate deep snow and hollow hair so that they stay warm in the really sub-zero temperatures. All of these mule deer are leaving Grand Teton National Park, crossing a number of jurisdictional boundaries as they travel to their winter ranges and other parts of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. But that's not unique just to mule deer. There are many other transboundary species here in Grand Teton National Park. For example, grizzly bears also spend some part of the year outside of the national park foraging on other resources, on surrounding national forest lands. They might be denning outside of the national park. Uh, they might be dispersing through lands outside of the national park. So what we've learned is that many of these species in Grand Teton rely on these lands outside of the park. It's critically important that we form these partnerships with other agencies, uh, local community members, uh, other organizations in order to protect these lands to provide these transboundary species all the resources they need to persist. Every time we put a collar out, we never knew quite where that mule deer was going to end up. Idaho's been collaring mule deer for quite a few years and we noticed some movements going into Grand Teton National Park. We partnered with them to collar more deer to get a tighter migration, more data points, and really focus on the migration corridors these deer are using to get from Wyoming to Idaho. They're coming over the Tetons, migrating to the west. They come down through the forested habitats of the Caribou Targhee National Forest. They hit an open landscape, which is this ag land of Idaho. And there's intermixed BLM and private lands, and they traverse through that and enter into the Teton Canyon area to winter. And they show up here in late November on and winter here until March, April, and head back to the east to go back to summer range. The Teton Canyon, it's thousand feet deep in places, and with the south aspect slopes, there's good mountain brush with sagebrush, bitter brush, choke cherry, and the deer really utilize that to browse in the winter. Once these deer get into Idaho, they're almost exclusively on private lands, and it's imperative we work with these landowners to maintain this deer herd. It's pretty dry. This migration that coming out of the Tetons that comes through your property or is something you said that you've seen the deer, but did, did you realize how far they went to Grand Teton National Park? We have no idea where they go after they leave here. We feel the deer really needs ground like this because that's going to be one of the few open places they got to go through and go to. We're looking to put a conservation easement on the majority of this ground, just a little less than 2,000 acres. We realize in watching what's happening around this county and Teton County that this land is getting to be more valuable and it's starting to disappear because they're developing a lot of it. And we don't want to see this developed. They've got to have something or we're going to lose them. From the northeastern part of the park, we see deer that go through wilderness areas and end up in the South Fork of the Shoshone and the North Fork of the Shoshone River outside of Cody, Wyoming. My name is Tony Mong. I'm the wildlife biologist with Wyoming Game and Fish out of the Cody office. And we manage the mule deer herd that actually winters over here in Cody and summers in the Teton National Park. Winter range here in the Cody area is pretty interesting. Um, a lot of times we think of winter range and where these animals live as, as big open landscapes with no human influences. But here in Cody, we actually have a mix of both public and private lands. 
And so our private landowners become a partner in the management of our mule deer here in this area. Without their partnership and without them uh, coming alongside of Game and Fish and, and others that, that manage the land, these mule deer would not have a place to go. So this particular mule deer is really cool. She's a great representative of the rest of the herd and some of the challenges that they face during their migration from Cody on the winter range side over to Teton National Park. Now this deer in particular crosses some very high mountain passes, nearly 10,000 feet in elevation. And on her way there is crossing at least two different river complexes that are swollen with that snow melt that's coming down and causing these rivers to, to run in a way that in many cases can sweep these deer away very easily. But year after year, these deer are making that traverse across this landscape. But what's really cool is that when they go to their summer ranges, they go to some of the most remote places where they never see another person. So when they come over to Cody, we're really seeing a collision of people and some of the most remote, amazing country uh, that we have here in the lower 48. A lot of game trails coming up off the bottom. You can see a few deer right down here looking up at us. I'm Arthur Lawson. I'm the director of Shoshone Rappel Tribal Fishing Game. I'm an enrolled member of the Northern Rappel Tribe. It's my duties and responsibilities to uh, protect the natural resources on the Wind River Reservation. For the last several years, we've been uh, tracking the migration of the mule deer coming on and off the reservation. We've tracked them uh, over 100 miles from the middle of the reservation all the way to Grand Teton National Park. What we found out through our studies is that the deer uh, migrate all the way to Jackson Hole, Grand Teton National Park for the forage. They summer up there, then they come back down to the reservation to winter. Uh, we've even tracked one from the, the park all the way down to right to Crowheart Butte. The Shoshone and Arapaho tribes are two of the 24 tribes that have cultural ties to Teton National Park. When the deer migrate back onto the reservation, they're under our protection throughout the winter months when they come down here and feed. The deer you see here on the Wind River Reservation are probably some of the same deer you see on the Grand Teton National Park. It's our responsibility to help these animals survive and migrate back and forth. And so stewards of the land today need to, to understand that we need to be involved and let the animals have the opportunity to travel back and forth. Our ancestors recognized these migration routes and grew to learn the path of the pronghorn. The pronghorn trails that go from the Teton area south to the Green River. Those places are actually named by our people. Rock Chuck House is an ancient place near present day Pinedale, Wyoming. According to archaeological digs, the first evidence of these hunting grounds, the pronghorn being killed in large numbers, goes back to 6,000 years. So historically there was a, an awareness that pronghorn, that summer in Jackson Hole, left the valley and made their way to the upper Green River Basin. 
Trapper's Point area has been a known hotspot for mule deer and pronghorn collisions since the 1990s. Wyoming Department of Transportation constructed the world's first overpass for pronghorn at Trapper's Point in 2012. It has been successful at reducing mortalities to wildlife as well as making it much safer for motorists to drive through that area. What makes this area so beautiful and attracts so many people to it are also the same pressures that are starting to undermine these migration routes. More traffic on roadways, more residential development, more fencing, uh, all of these things combine to to restrict animal movements and are taking a toll on the migrations. Millions of people love to come to Grand Teton National Park each year to see the wildlife. Yet these animals only spend the summer here. They spend many months in Idaho and Wyoming. We need to be able to partner, to work together to protect these migration areas. Landowners, nonprofits, and government agencies have been working for decades to help migrating wildlife by completing projects like wildlife friendly fence modifications and wildlife crossing projects across the region. I think everyone has a responsibility to protect these migration quarters and probably the easiest thing you can do is drive safer. Drive slowly, be aware of the migrations, keep an eye out for wildlife, and do your best to, to obey the speed limit. We've got incredible coordination across all of the land types, public, private, working lands, uh, in order to protect the migration corridors. The farming and ranching model has been compatible with these wildlife movements. It's allowed for the open spaces to continue. A conservation easement is an agreement that a farmer or rancher makes to protect the conservation characteristics of their property forever. It also protects the ability to continue to keep that land in agriculture uh, for farming and ranching purposes and allows the continued movement of animals across the landscape. Ranchers are important stewards for the wildlife habitat because what is good for healthy branches is also good for wildlife. This place is it's a magical place. There's nowhere else in the lower 48 like it. There's very few places in the world, and it's been something that people before us have stewarded and taken care of. It's something I think a lot of us feel an obligation to continue to take care of and to steward. It's, it's not just the agencies, it's not just the land managers, it's not just the private land owners who are taking care of this landscape. It's really been this collective effort by not only the people who live here, but the people who love and visit here uh, to take care of this, this ecosystem. Each of us can be stewards. If we love this place, we can be aware of the choices that we make, the things that we do, and making sure that they support and protect wildlife. This landscape is an iconic part of America, a core part of this landscape of this magnificent wildlife. Rarely can you go any place in this country to be able to see the diversity of species, the range of animals, yet you can come here winter, summer, fall, across this vast area and see this magnificent wildlife. What we've seen these deer do is just been amazing. They've gone to places that we never imagined and have um, connected us to places. 
My goal is that we're able to find and prioritize and enact these uh, conservation actions so that we can have um, these migratory wildlife here in Grand Teton National Park in perpetuity. I want to have this space like it is now for my children, including all the wildlife species that live here. There's not a lot of places in the West that still have what we have around here, and so we need to work very hard to keep what we have in place before we lose it. What I care about is that my kids' kids will be able to come and see the very things that we get to see. I've seen this herd since I was a little kid, and it means a lot to me to maintain this for my kids to get to see it and kids after that, as well as anybody out there that wants to see migrations. We have studied these beautiful, magnificent creatures. They have traversed the land. They have established these migration routes. These powerful animals sometimes move in a way that is beyond description. To see them, to witness this, lets us know they are worth protecting. We must honor this sacred calling and protect these beautiful animals and these migration routes. Thank you.